True Story is a documentary podcast powered by the Institute of Documentary Film. You can find news from the world of film on all the common platforms such as iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, as well as on docweb.net. <laughs> Hello, welcome everyone for the third edition of Who is Who in Documentary Industry 2022, part of this year's IDF industry sessions organized by the Institute of Documentary Film in Prague. My name is Marion Schmidt and I'm one of the two co-directors of the Documentary Association of Europe. We are super happy about this ongoing partnership with the IDF and would like to thank the whole great team um, for this continuous support and the fruitful collaboration. In this session today, um, we will spend time with four representatives of film funds that are ready to finance documentary projects from all across Europe, the world, but also Central and Eastern Europe. We'll spend 45 minutes to get to know them and um, learn more about the funds that they are representing and how to best engage with them. I'm um, super happy to introduce my four amazing guests today, which are Isabel Arat Fernandez of Itva Bertha Fund, Alex Salat of Docs Up Fund, Jane Maud from The Wickers, and last but not least, Alessandro Groplero of React. I did it, I did it. Thank you all for spending this 45 minutes with me today. And um, because we only have 45 minutes, I will jump right into it and start with Isabel to ask her to introduce herself, her role at the ITFA Bertha Fund, the fund, and also the other things that ITFA are doing to support documentary filmmakers. The floor is yours, Isabel. Thank you, Marion, and thank you for having me here. So I'm uh, Isabel, I run the Itfa Bertha Fund, which is a fund that uh, supports filmmakers from Africa, Asia, Latin America, Caribbean, Oceania, and uh, countries in Eastern Europe. Uh, we uh, have been doing this for over 20 years and do this through different uh, funding schemes that we have available. At the core of the work that we do are these regions that I just mentioned and um, exactly what countries <laughs> of these regions uh, can apply or are applicable is most easy to find when you look on our website and look at the what we call the IBF country list. From Eastern Europe, it's the countries in Eastern Europe but that are not a member of uh, the media program. And uh, for these group of uh, or filmmakers from these countries, we have a funding scheme called the Itfa Bertha Fund Classic, where we support development and uh, productions of uh, documentaries. We do this twice a year, two deadlines, always the 10th of December and the 10th of June. For really the uh, details on the regulations, I think it's best to look at the Itfa website and then the section of the Itfa Bertha Fund. What I can say about Itfa Bertha Fund Classic is that it's um, quite a, a competitive uh, strand or funding scheme, we receive around 600, 650 uh, projects a year. And we are now, as of this year, selecting 25, divided between development and production support. We try to make the process as um, easy as possible by actually uh, dividing it into two steps. So the initial step when you apply, the information you have to provide is uh, all centered around the project proposals so or a synopsis, a project description, a motivation, and really basic information on the core team of the project. On the basis of that, we make a pre-selection. Uh, and then the projects that are pre-selected have to send in additional information like budget information and more detailed information on the structure or the concept of the film. And that information is then added uh, to the proposal we already had to be discussed in a final meeting. The other funding uh, stream, uh, funding scheme that we have that I think uh, and that we've been working hard on uh, can be particularly interesting for producers in Eastern Europe is what we call the Itfa Bertha Fund Europe, which is for the support of international co-productions. 
where the applicant in this case is a European producer, so of a country part of the media program that is co-producing with a, a team in Africa, Asia, Latin America, uh, and the countries in Eastern Europe that are on the IBF classic list. So just to make it more easy, an example, the earth is blue as an orange, was a co-production between the Ukraine and Lithuania and is a production we supported. We have now, for example, I think last year in the last round, we supported a project uh, that has, oh, yeah, two projects that have a Romanian uh, producer. One is Alice that just premiered in the Berlinale and that was a co-production with Colombia. The other Romanian producer is co-producing actually also with Colombia, totally different project. Angel 60, uh, 96 that is in production at this moment. So the whole purpose of uh, the Italian Birth Fund uh, Europe is really to uh, support these kinds of collaborations across continents. The amounts we give in this category are also a little bit bigger. It's, we only do six projects a year, but uh, the co-production grants are 40,000 euros. Um, at the moment, we're waiting to know when our next deadline will be because we're up for a new round of financing from the European Union. And we're actually in the middle now of um, yeah, uh, writing this proposal and sending it in the first days of April. So we are going to announce a deadline for this year. Now, we normally it was the 1st of April. We will have to postpone that, but I expect that probably in June, we will announce a deadline for the new call for the IBF Europe, IBF Europe co-production. Um, this uh, um, category is less competitive than uh, the IBF Classic. Up until now, we are receiving, say, on an average, 40 applications a year. And as I said, we support um, six. Then, um, with regards to... Uh, Reapplica Obviously, when you receive so many proposals and you can only select a few, projects are rejected. We are quite, uh, uh, with the IB, uh, IFA Bertha Fund Europe, you can always reapply with a project, you can always come back. With the IVF Classic, it really depends. That's so competitive that, that there, we do accept projects for a second time, but we really only uh, prefer to see them again or to, uh, review them again once there's really been a change or a project has moved to a next phase. So if you're rejected for development, you can always come back for production or, or if you were re rejected in production, you can always reapply for post-production when there is like more edited material of the film. Um, next to the, the financial uh, support that we give to projects, actually the support we give to project is twofold, but it's a financial grant. And at the same time, we also look at in what other ways we can support a project. And this really depends on the team and the project. For starting filmmakers, we really look into how we can make them part of or make them participate in the training program that ITFA organized. And this can be uh, the workshops like the ITFA project space, but it can also be the ITFA Academy, which takes place in November. Sometimes neither of these programs fits. So, so then we look at something more individual and. This really ranges from uh, preparing a production proposal for projects in development to giving feedback in a rough cut stage, or now also more and more uh, finding a consultant to advise a team on whether, for example, getting into an international co-production. Um, and I think that's a little bit it on how we work, unless there's something I'm forgetting, Marion. <laughs> I don't think you're forgetting anything. Thank you very much. As usual, a lot of information and many lists. I guess sometimes it's uh, complex for people yeah. to go through uh, to find out whether they're eligible and to which um, fund they can apply. What I mean, there every all the information is available on the website, of course, and it is organized in a quite um, clear way. I would say, if there are still questions left, whom to get in touch with and when. Um, well, when is, I guess, whenever you have a question, I would say. Usually this happens one day before the deadline, though. No, that's a, preferably a little bit earlier. Um, and who to get in touch with? I think on the, you, we have a general email address, which is the itfabirthafund at itfa.nl. 
And actually, I mean, also just to clarify, the Itfa Bertha Fund is three people. So somebody will read that email. It's not, it's not going to get lost in translation or in an inbox. So uh, definitely, you can also try to give us a call, though I have to say that getting back to the office from COVID at ITFA has been a challenge to be have everybody reachable on phone. So in that sense, if you're in a hurry, email works better. And um, basically, I think, I mean, often uh, we have a frequently asked questions, but of course, there are also very specific questions questions people may have, particularly with the co-production category and the qualification requirements or eligibility requirements, as you're saying. So, I mean, we, you can always reach us by email for those. So that's not a problem. That, would, that brings me back to one question that I had for the IBF uh, Europe. When would you say is the right moment to apply? That's a very good question. Um, IBF Europe, because of the constraints that we have to meet, with the European, uh, European Union has uh, definitely a deadline of when a film should be delivered. So the category is for the financing of production, but a project that is really like at the end of a development phase or very early production, I would say it's, it's better to wait also because of uh, the requirements to finalize the grants once a project is selected because the projects that are selected have, um, in order to really uh, receive the grants, you need to have 50% of your financing in place. And after selections, there are six months to be able to, to get to that point. But it does mean that you need, to have, you need to be at that stage where you have a prospect of really being able to realize that. Otherwise, we have to cancel the, gra the grant after six months. And I, we prefer not to do that, actually, after a project is selected. So in that sense, like start production, mid-production is the earliest that I would recommend uh, to apply for the IBF Europe. Thank you. Also, so by the way, one very, and, and this is related to this, this is an international co-production fund. So the co-production uh, and then particularly the papers that come with the co-production need to be in order. So when you apply, we accept applications when there is only a memo deal, but the moment the project is selected, part also of finalizing and confirming the final grant is uh, that we need a signed co-production agreement between the different producers attached to a project. And sometimes that also takes quite a lot of time because people just apply too early when they're like just starting to co-produce and 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 then it, it it takes too much time at some point and one actually i mean that's now that we're on it one like the most crucial eligibility criterion for ibf europe is the structure of the co-production and that is related to the um, the share of the european producers so uh, if there's more than one all of them uh, together which up until now uh, had to be a minimum of 20% and could not be more than 70%. And I think that for the coming round, we're going to change that and we're going to stop supporting uh, majority productions of European producers. So it's going to be minimum 20 and maximum 50 to, um, yeah, create, to support a different kind of uh, uh, co-productions. Well, depending on the perspective, um, that's very good news or not so good news depending on where you stand on the application. So yes. just briefly in summary, um, IBF Classic, three possibilities for development, for production and for post-production. Yeah. Um, highly competitive. So if you apply and you're rejected, it might not necessarily have to do with your project, but you can reapply, but only reapply after there is um, certain visible development, there's visible development in yeah. within the project. IVF Europe for the support of co-productions um, of European producers with non-European um, producers. And um, the deadlines are coming, the next, next deadlines are for IVF Europe, you don't know yet. No, but I expect, because we're, as I said, we're like this in the middle of writing the new proposal, and because of the delay of the European Union, we have been delayed, so we need to figure out the new timeline, but I, it will be before the European summer, the deadline. Okay. So to, to our audience out there, go to the Itfa Bertha Fund website and read 
eligibility criteria and follow the fund and or the festival yeah. on the social media channels because this is also where the new deadlines will Definitely. be announced. And in the ITFA industry menu. So that's also a possibility to keep up to date with regards to the deadlines. And sign up to the newsletters, of course. Yeah. They are. Thank you very much, Isabel. And of course, be in touch with Isabel and her beautiful team in case you have more questions. Thank you very, very much. I'm moving on to Alex Salat of Docs Up Fund, a still relatively new fund in particular compared to um, the ITFA Bertha Fund. It is allocated to European and international feature length documentaries that are dedicated to human rights. So Alex, tell us a little bit more about the fund and uh, how you select projects and accompany them in their journey. So the, the, the funds uh, exist since uh, three, four years. Uh, we are, there is no problem of eligibility because we are looking for uh, feature land documentaries about all the world. We are not taking any rights about the projects and we are not expecting any return of the fund and money we are giving. So it's really open and the idea is just uh, to find the projects uh, because we don't have, uh, how can I say, defined budget, uh, yearly defined budget. We are not making uh, appeal to projects like uh, Beta Fund, ITFA and other places are doing. I'm picking up projects everywhere. I'm involved in a pitching session, as a tutor, as a festival. And so we are trying just to help uh, directors and producers at three main stages of development and productions. That means at the beginning to make a teaser, a good teaser. At the moment, uh, nobody has, uh, has shot anything. You don't know exactly how to present because today without any teaser, you cannot attend any places. So it's important and the teaser are so bad in general that you are just saying, don't show it, don't, don't show it. It's preferable just to speak about the project. So it's important just to improve the teasers. Uh, secondly, it's after the shooting for the rough cut. We are accompanying and uh, following all the projects uh, with an open line. The people can come at any moment uh, to us. Uh, sending a rough cut, sending something, and we will answer and we are uh, giving a feedback. And the last point that we are beginning to develop now is for the promote the campaign impact promotion. That means that sometimes we find the movie very strong, but uh, okay, it's picture locked, it's almost finished, and we think that uh, it needs to be, uh, to be follow a company and help. It's the, for example, that, ex uh, for example, too close is one of the examples that I find that uh, the ITFA last time after the presentation at Doc Incubator, I knew the project from a very long time, but it was presented there. I met them at ITFA and they were telling just, just to begin the impact campaign, the, the company we want to recruit is asking 50,000 euro. So I, I was saying the project is strong. It works to make a promo campaign. So I, will, I, I don't have 50,000 euro, but I will give you the half of that. And then with the half of that, they have begun the impact campaign. So we are trying to react very uh, urgently when the people are, have precise requests. For example, it was the same for another movie that I found in uh, Tokyo Docs, Sunday in Japan, they needed a fund just to be, um, to be accepted at hot dogs. And uh, the teaser was not enough good for me. So I just told them, I'm in, I give you money just to improve the teaser. And then, okay, they changed the teaser, they were accepted at hot dogs and they were at free pack dogs. So now uh, we are not a huge fund, we are meeting once or twice a year. Uh, I have a small uh, committee selection of people and we are sharing all the projects. Principally, I'm receiving all the projects. I'm answering to all the projects and I'm watching all the projects and reading everything. I'm not looking 
for you know the French people in general they they like very uh, huge uh, scripts. I I don't want a script. I want images. I think that because we are filmmakers, I'm expecting images. Even if the teaser is not made, I want just to feel what the director has in mind. So even images that can give a sort of, uh, how can I say, uh, indication of the film, uh, images he wants to look for is important. So images, a short presentation, the shorter is the best, a schedule of production, of course. I don't mind about the, um, about how can I say the, um, the, 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 it's not a problem of uh, finding a broadcaster or not a broadcaster or having all the money or not having the, all the money. Because we are deciding, it depends the stage of the development, but because we are trying just to help them as we can help them, sometimes we don't have the money, but I can say, I will fundraise for you. That yeah. doesn't mean that I'm becoming the producer or taking any rights but I will fundraise to find the money for the film. And then during I'm fundraising, I can help by accompanying the film too, uh, by the by edit editorial way of uh, advices and following. That's mainly the, the way we are working. Uh, the, the, the most important thing is to feel totally free about the, the way we are choosing the projects. No slots no formats, no length, no, what can I say, any pressure of uh, that broadcaster, another one, I don't mind. And it's open to anybody. Just send the mail or to me directly or go and send a message uh, on, the, on the, the website of Doxet Fund and you will get an answer. That sounds so liberating. Thank you very much, Alex. It sounds so, so liberating. But still, I'm wondering, so is it a lot about making a case? Like, for instance, you gave this example of the impact campaign. So, for instance, if I would like to approach you, I mean, it's one thing if you meet uh, films in, or projects and festivals at pitching forums, you get to talk to them, um, you like what you see, and they tell you that they're missing this particular co-financing or that there's a gap or they would like to start the impact campaign and this is what they're missing. Or you see the trailer and you see a potential in um, turning, turning it into a, a better trailer. But then also there's this moment when I might want to contact you. So if I'm a filmmaker in a situation, do I make a case? Like, would I say, this is my material and what I would really need now I think, as being the filmmaker at least, um, is um, a better trailer. And for this, I think I would need this amount of money. Is this what you're looking for? I, you know, the, the amount of money, we are deciding the amount of money. There is not mm -hmm. a precise amount of money. It depends. Sometimes it depends on the money we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are sharing the money we have because I'm giving all the money we have, but. Uh, for a, for a teaser, it's not the same amount that uh, we are giving for a rough cut. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, if the people don't have a rough cut, when I'm speaking about images, they don't have to send me a complete rough cut. They just can send me 20 minutes, uh, 40 minutes, what they have. Uh, but it has to be something edited, just to see the way of the storytelling, of the narration. Some things add to to be representative of what the director mm -hmm. has in mind. It's not just rushes, because rushes can kill, can kill a project uh, also. So uh, for the people, they, they have to be aware and send things that are, that are making sense, not only for them, but for us too, as yeah. watchers that don't know anything about the projects. And then uh, exactly the, the, you know, for example, I will give you another example, uh, uh, the, the film President. At a certain point, it was finished. We decided to, <laughs> to support the film. It was finished. So we say, okay, it's going to be uh, for, the, for the promotion, impact campaign. And then I spoke with the producer, Singh Birge, and she explained to me why it's important, the impact campaign, uh, uh, to make an impact campaign in Africa, 
uh, the people need money just because they cannot move at night. They have a curfew, so they have to stay on place. So they need hostels. They cannot. They have to to be very aware how they are moving. They, it's very difficult to uh, to organize uh, screenings and so on. So the money was completely needed for them. Okay. So we decided to give the money at that moment. But after that, it depends the other urgency that we had at the same moment with other projects. So we are sharing. And if a project didn't get any fund, it can be the second round. The, the projects can be can come back. And we are giving also, I'm giving a few awards during the pitching sessions at Close Up, at Movies That Matters for the Raft Cuts, at even uh, Cine Doc Tbilisi or other places. Uh, at Nyon, this year it will be at Nyon uh, for, uh, for some projects. So it's really open. And when we are giving an award, the projects and the, the, the team can come back for the teaser, a Raft Cut, and so on. Mm. So it's a very tailor-made approach like that, that I can see, which is great. Um, but the only, the only eligibility criteria is then that it has to be a film that deals with human rights issues, yes. correct? Human rights, it's so wide. In the broadest sense, the word, of course, yeah. Thank you, Alex. So that means if people uh, would like to know more or see if they can receive, so they should find you in the places that you just mentioned that you will be attending, but also can check out the website and send in an email with either their question or already with some sort of a application or proposal of how they would like to receive support from the fund. Just to, to be to be clear, you know, when we are speaking about human rights, all the topics are relevant. I, mm -hmm. I will say it's not important. I don't, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in all the projects about human rights. The difference is between the way of writing, about mm -hmm. the storytelling and about the narrative structure. That makes the difference. So after that, everything is open. That's a good uh, last word for the presentation of the fund. Thank you so much, Alex. I'm moving on to Jane, who's Jane Mont, who's joining us from the UK. And sadly, her cat has left the scene. Hold on a minute. There you are. <laughs> Hello. So Jane and her cat, I forgot his name. Teddy. Um, Teddy, no, really Teddy are joining us from, from the UK, from London, if I'm not mistaken. Just so. Jane, Jane is representing the Wickers today. Who is, and the Wickers is supporting emerging film and audio, audio documentary makers, makers in the funding and production. And yeah, tell us a little bit more about how you're supporting emerging voices at the Wickers. Thanks for having us and uh, fascinating hearing about the other funds. I always like picking up more information for those people who don't get through our rather competitive process because we do support projects even if they don't get funded because we really, really want to help to create a good ecology for first time directors. And it is really a director's fund. The fund is about finding people who we feel have got a strong voice. They want to have their own authorship of a story and we want to give them their first big break um, as a director. So they might have done other jobs in production. They might have worked in fiction, but it's for first time directors at feature length. Um, so it's for people who haven't made anything that's 50 minutes or longer. Um, so we, um, we are open um, as a fund once a year um, and we open in October and the uh, closing date is the end of January. And at the end of January, we go through a lot of applications, over 200 this year. Um, and start to shortlist and we create a shortlist which comes out in early April and then um, some judges which include um, judges from uh, distribution companies, from Netflix, from um, producers who are actually making films themselves and ourselves. We create a shortlist of five finalists and then those projects we pay for those um, filmmakers to come to Sheffield Documentary Festival to have pitch training and then to pitch. And at the end of the pitch um, uh, session, they, we award the top 
prize and also a runners up development prize. So the, the top award is, is now £100,000. So different in uh, euros and, and dollars, um, probably more in dollars, a lot more in dollars, especially if you're in Australia. Um, and uh, it, the runner up is the development of 20,000. So um, all five projects that get selected, though, tend to happen because uh, it's quite a, a lot of people have their say in the process and they get quite close to the project. So I think if anyone's got through to five, it's very likely that their project is going to, to happen in some way or form. And even when we're not able to give the money, as I say, we tend to support and mentor those projects right through to completion. So to be able to apply, as, as well as not having made more than 50 minutes, you need um, to be at the right stage. So we're very much about um, being in late development or early production um, at the time of application. So if you imagine in January, end of January, um, we don't want to have, you to have shot so much that really you don't need £100,000 to go and film because we, we're not a post-production fund. Obviously, we know some of the money will go into post-production, but it's really about money that will help you um, film uh, some key scenes that without that money, you know, you wouldn't be able to do that, um, that, that filming. So that's really important to us. And then the other thing is that when you apply, there's the usual application um, on, online. Um, and uh, when you apply, we expect up to six minutes of footage. And it's really interesting hearing what Alex has said, how important a teaser is. Some people haven't got that far. They might have only got a few scenes. But I think you're right, Alex, that having some sort of edit in it um, helps to give us more of an understanding of the eye, the authorship. Um, so uh, it doesn't have to be the full six minutes, but um, it has to be at least six minutes. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's critical during the process. Um, I think those are the key things. The other thing to say is we, we cover the whole world. So our winners have been from pretty much every continent in the world um, we've been going for six years um, and we have no subject specialism it can be anything it's about uh, a, a strong voice of the director and also um, taking us to new places either physical or mental you know being curious about things and because our founder Alan Wicker um, had a bit of a wit about him we also like to look for things that that have a certain take and have light and shade if possible. It's not always going to be possible. Um, so I was thinking back on whether we've had any Central or Eastern European finalists and the answer's no, which is fantastic because that means that we are speaking to the right audience here. We expect a lot of applications. And this year we've actually had more applications from Eastern Europe and Central Europe than we've ever had before. So the message is out there, we hope. But we hope to get more. And we have had people in the shortlist who've been from Ukraine and Siberia and other countries. Um, and we're really hoping that we'll, we'll get a, a finalist from, um, from your region very soon. But we have no criteria, um, even though we're UK based, that means nothing in terms of preferences. It's always about the story. The story comes first. And there's a nice story from Kameh, our team who won last year from Afghanistan, because they were told that our fund was too competitive and it was a waste of their time to put in for it. And they quite rightly thought, well, if we don't put in for it, we haven't got a chance of winning. And they did win. So, you know, if you're at all unsure, we really want to hear from you. Um, and you, you can write to us, info at Wicker Awards, which is .com, which is on our website. Um, we're also hoping to do an open house call for northern and southern hemisphere countries just when our applications open in October. So you'll be able to come and talk to us directly. Obviously, we go to many events like this. And we try to be seen as much as possible so you know that we're accessible and that we're really happy to talk to you. It's not a competition to see, you know, whether you can get fooled by an application form. We want you to know everything possible and to have the best chance of getting through. And we hate you to fall down because of some technical issue about what you may or may not say on a form. Um, so we're really open to hear from anyone.
Thank you so much, Jane, for these encouraging words. Um, just one question, because you were saying the award is there to support directors mostly. Um, at the same time, I read in your eligibility criteria that a production company needs to be um, applying for the money. Can you just give our audience a little more detail as to why this is the case and if there are any criteria around this that um, applicants should take into consideration before applying? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that with emerging documentary makers, it could be literally anyone. And we've had people who've never made any film in their life. We don't know anything about them. Um, and we're about to give them £100,000. Well, we would like to know that there's a bank account that's reliable and there's a, somebody in their team or somebody who's willing to vouch for them and some place where there is uh, the money can be properly accounted for um, and we can make sure that we get onto a production timetable with them. But we really want the director to not be swamped by having too many people around them who will give them different points of view and get them quite confused. We want, we want people around them who will support them to come out with something that's authentically their own voice at the end of the process. Thank you. And I'm just kind of, I'm gonna stay on this point just for a little longer, technically speaking, that means that um, the director the, the director is supplying and it's the producer attached that is signing the contract with you in the end just for this for the reasons that you just outlined. Yeah, not always. Sometimes the director has has their own um, setup. Or that, yes. Um, so yeah, it could be them directly. And then last question, because you were saying you are um, reducing from an impressive two hundred applications down to five, which I'm sure is. A great experience, but also a lot of work. Again, to everyone out there, listen to these numbers. So when you receive a rejection, it has nothing to do with you. It's just part of the normal process. Um, between the selection of the five, uh, the shortest of the five and the presentation at, the, at Sheffield, are you working with them? Because you said you were mentoring yes. the project. Is this the period during which you're working with them? And what yes. does happen in, during this time? Yes. Yeah, so before the five, we do announce a shortlist of at least 12 so that people can get an understanding of the sorts of projects that we think are strong enough to win. Nobody on that list of 12 would be incapable of winning. So that, that helps people to understand that. So that comes out early April. And then with the five, once they've been selected, the finalists, we um, work with them on their trailers um, and with their materials and their pitches. To, to give them an understanding of where they might want to go. And afterwards, we help them to find other funds, to find other people who can support them. And we stay very hands-on throughout the process. Thank you so much, Jane. So if you think your project is the right fit for the Wickers and you're an emerging director, go to the website and apply and don't let anyone tell you that you shouldn't apply for it. Thank you very much, Jane. Last but not least, I'm moving to Alessandro. Thank you for waiting so patiently. Um, Alessandro is representing REACT, quite interesting pan-regional initiative that was set up between the Croatian Audiovisual Center, Briuli Venezia, Giulia Audiovisual Fund, Slovenia Film Center, and the Film Center Serbia. Um, and you're running workshops, but also have a co-development fund that you're going to tell us more about. Yeah, thank you, Mario. Thank you so much for having me today. And uh, it was a pleasure to listen to all the other funds. I already had a chance to know them a little bit before, but it's, of course, very nice to see how we could all be complementary. And I think that this is the, uh, the part of our, let's say, the, the most important part where setting up a fund, how to be complementary to what exists already around. And uh, I was, uh, I'm part of the, one of the uh, four partners of REACT which stands for Regional Audiovisual Cooperation and Training. And it's an initiative that, of course, includes also a funding scheme, but it's not only that. The funding scheme could not exist uh, unless there were the other parts of this initiative. And REACT was uh, set up in 2015, so it's already seven years. And as you said, it's, four, it's at the beginning, we were three funds, which is the Croatian and the Slovenian and us, here in Italy, is three neighboring countries that had already some kind of cooperation, very, very, let's say, uh, rare, 
but we felt that we could give somehow an idea of, let's say, uh, a more structured collaboration between our three industries. And the way we thought about was not only to create a co-development fund, but also to create a long, let's say, journey where we could really include different actions that could be somehow useful and beneficial to bring together our three industries. Uh, in 2019, Film Center Serbia joined us, and, uh, and now we have these four countries collaborating all year around. So basically, yes, one thing that for sure it's uh, important to say is that being only these four funds involved so far, the uh, eligible producers and the eligible projects for this fund are only from these four countries. But we are considering, uh, we have been considering in the past whether to try to enlarge, as we did with, for example, with the Film Center Serbia, we are still considering how and if it could make sense to basically also expand uh, the, let's say, the scope of the fund. Very briefly, the action of REACT starts uh, every year with the organization of few training programs where we try literally to bring together the, uh, the four film industries and uh, where we literally try to bring together the producers from the, the different countries uh, in order to have them meeting each other and sharing details about their, about their projects and about uh, themselves. The idea is that we develop these connections, we develop the projects in the training program, and in the past we've been working together with Ex Oriente, Eurodoc, in different phases because we work for the development phase, but we also work during the post-production phase with other programs such as the First Cut Lab, and the idea is really to have them meeting, finding possible partners, and then in the second part of the year, being able to apply to submit a, an application to our co-development funding scheme. Speaking about the co-development funding scheme that we launch every year in October, we have one month uh, to collect all the applications. It's a very simple, it's a very simple fund with a very little amount of development in place. But we feel that this development is not, it's not only, uh, let's say, beneficial for the uh, further development of the project, it's a quality stamp, but it's also, it gives easily access to our, let's say, the minority co-production funding scheme of each fund. So it's a, it's a sort of, let's say, it's a possibility to create a long-term collaboration with our funds. The, uh, the um, let's say that uh, we can give a maximum support of 10,000 euros for the development. We receive more or less between 40 and 50 applications uh, and we can, uh, we can uh, support six pro uh, eight projects per, per year because it's normally it's two, we try to have an average of two projects per country. One important thing to say is that we do not support only documentaries. Of course, we are uh, supporting every year documentaries, but we do support also feature length fiction and also animation, uh, especially short projects, uh, animation projects. The, uh, as I was saying, of course, uh, the fact that, let's say that the priority, of course, is supporting the projects, but it's really bringing together the industries. So the idea is that, um, of course, we cannot support all the projects that we are, let's say, receiving, but there is a, absolutely the opportunity, the possibility to reapply in case uh, your, the, the application is rejected. So it's possible to, 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 to reapply. Uh, the, uh, the con the, let's say the condition to be able to be eligible is that the project should have a funding support, in, a development funding support in place from one of the four countries. There should be at least two co-producers from uh, the two, two of the four member countries. So, and we accept being the development phase, we absolutely accept to, we, we accept uh, memo deals in this phase. We think that, uh, of course, in terms of application form and materials to be submitted, especially for documentaries, we encourage to also to include teasers and visual materials. But we know that sometimes it's very early, in a very early phase. So we are also happy to, to know that our 10,000 euros can also contribute to possibly support the realization of a, a proper teaser uh, in order to be able then to be exposed in other markets, in other, in other let's say, platforms. 
um, let's say that as, as, I were, as I was mentioning, the idea is that we have been trying to create an initiative that has different goals with, the, let's say, different objectives. And so the fact that we have been working so much in terms of, let's say, training the producers and training the, the, our um, authors, we saw that we, we, we are basically there is a constant dialogue with our, let's say, foreign industries. And we realized that after seven years, we realized that maybe now the biggest problem that we have after being very successful in bringing together the, uh, the four industries is that we are facing a big problem in terms of circulation of the things that we do support in the four countries. And over the past year, we've been working a lot to, to try to create a new distribution plan. So basically last year, we, we organized a distribution lab, bringing together producers, distributors, funders, uh, and exhibitors from the four countries. We spent together four uh, days in an island, beautiful island in uh, Croatia. And we came up with certain idea on how to possibly help uh, the films that uh, we support for the development and that are then made. And this year, we are about to work on a new fund for let's say helping uh, the realization of marketing material, promotional materials, uh, subtitling the films for the four countries. So we are moving towards, let's say, a, a company in these projects also, let's say, to, to reach their audience, at least from our four countries, the React audience. So I don't know if I mentioned everything. I, uh, ah, no, well, one important thing. Of course, uh, we, uh, we are happy to support stories that are connecting thematically our countries that could be, let's say, uh, contemporary things, like historical things, but it's not mandatory at all. So we had stories that are speaking about our four countries and about, let's say, the fact that we are a, a very close region, but it's absolutely not a, a mandatory criteria. Thank you so much, Alessandro. I can only imagine how sometimes um, negotiating between all of these different partners is also an interesting work to do. It's great that you managed to get to this point. Hence my question, are you uh, actively looking to expand the amount of partners that are involved to broaden the region as well? Or is this per currently not part of um, the plan? Let's say that uh, at the beginning, one of the strongest points of our action was really that the three countries really had the same goals, same, uh, same uh, willingness, same, uh, let's say, same needs. And uh, when uh, Films Turned to Serbia approached us, we, we re realized that they really had, they were on the same page. So it was very, a very easy process. For the future, we are considering, especially for this, this distribution plan, it's something that could be somehow probably expanded because I think it's one of the, 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 the biggest challenges that all of us are facing. And we were thinking that probably this could be one of the, uh, let's say, strengths that we could somehow imagine to develop uh, with other possible partners from other countries, neighboring countries uh, from, um, let's say, that are very close to React region, yeah. Thank you. And then one other question, just to be super sure. The being involved with the fund starts with participating in the workshop or a, um, the workshop where producers from the different regions are matched with each other. And then from there, the teams can apply for the development support, correct? Yeah, it's correct, though there is no an automatic, let's say, selection yes. process. So, for example, when we do collaborate with Exoriente or uh, Eurodoc, basically we have uh, the selection of the participants that is done in cooperation with them. And the idea is that in that specific framework, they can know each other, they can meet each other, they can find possible partners. And then there is the second part of the process, which is with the, uh, let's say, uh, with our funding scheme where basically if they found a co-producer, they can submit an application and we can support them. The fact that uh, it's not mandatory to have participated in the workshop. So let's say it's just the workshop is just, let's say a first step on a more, let's say, uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, industry uh, objective. So there is no, it's not really focusing on the projects. It's more focusing on bringing together the industries. So there is no connection. 
Got it. Okay, then I got this wrong before. Thank you very much for clarifying this for me. And um, last question, the selection process is between, I suppose, the different partners of React. Yes, exactly. We first have uh, international readers. We try to involve two readers that are not part of our region. So that basically we have a sort of, let's say, point of view that it's uh, external. And we really focus on, uh, let's say, the narrative and creative and artistic components of the films, but we also try to understand what could be the potential of circulation or the, the, uh, the potential of, let's say, the uh, viability of the project. And then we uh, have a second step where all the four funds have a representative and the four representatives of each fund discuss the final selection and uh, we came up uh, with the final eight projects that we do support. One last thing that I forgot to say, which is very important, is that the dialogue that we have with the industry, it's also, let's say, uh, affecting the regulations that we have in the funding scheme. After noticing that there were a lot of collaborations uh, uh, after the first two, three years of React, we realized that most of the producers were applying every time with the same producers from the other countries. And this was something that we really didn't really uh, wanted to create because we felt that there was the same, they were the same setup every year. And so we introduced this idea of having at least one member of the team, no matter if it's one producer or co-producer or the director, to be a first time or second time uh, professional. So in order to create, to bring some new blood uh, and fresh, uh, say artistic perspectives in the, in the projects. Thank you very much for adding this. Uh, I think it's a very interesting, um, yeah, interesting idea that you implemented there. I have so many more questions for all of you, actually, and I would love to hear a discussion between all of you, but I think we have to do this at another time because time's up, actually. We are already eight minutes over. Thank you very much for bearing with me and staying with me for a little longer. Thank you all once again for your time, for um, coming into the Zoom room today with me. I wish you all a beautiful rest of the day and also our audience a beautiful rest of the day or good morning or whatever time it is when they are going to watch this. Um, and thank you once again to the whole IDF team also for our technical support in the background. And um, it's just, just saying bye bye and See you all very soon, hopefully. Bye, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.